Hello, everybody. This is Georgianne Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And it is both a pleasure and a blessing to bring Olaf Hagee to you tonight. And Olaf and I are going to do some hashing out about universes and all kinds of stuff. Hi, Olaf. Hi, Georgianne. <laughs> Got your boxing gloves on? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yes, indeedy. Okay. Well. I'll give you the first punch. <laughs> well, there's a theory out there that I hope by now most people have heard about, and it's the idea that there are multiple universes, something called the multiverse, and that uh, we're just one of uh, a huge number, if not infinite number, of other universes. Mm -hmm. And this idea was developed about a decade ago by... Uh, really fleshed out by a guy named Max Tegmark at MIT. Yeah. The idea started from the following observations. It really goes back to a book uh, written by uh, Chandra Wickramasinghe and the late uh, Dr. Sir Fred Hoyle, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics for uh, his work on how uh, stars uh, create new elements through fusion at their cores. And they wrote the, a book called The Intelligent Universe, which I think you could probably still get a copy of through Amazon. And The Intelligent Universe argued that the physics of this universe, the way atoms uh, form uh, from basic helium and hydrogen and a little beryllium or whatever that we started with, uh, on up to the highest uh, elements up beyond uranium and so forth, uh, that the laws that govern science and uh, the whole universe, the quantities of things that are in the universe, all of this stuff is uniquely designed balanced on a nice edge of possibilities to produce life as we know it. Uh, it's sometimes called the anthropic principle. But the slightest variation in any direction, you know, higher or lower or, or more quantity or less quantity or whatever, in terms of the ratios and the, the amounts, and we wouldn't be here. Uh -huh. We couldn't be here no matter what. The, if, if you, uh, I don't want to get into the technical physics of it, because I'm not, uh, that, I did study physics in college, but I'm not, I'm not a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, so I can't do that. But uh, they listed in the book uh, dozens of different parameters of the laws of nature showing that the whole thing was structured in a way to bring about the potential for life as we understand it. Now, having said that, they then said, well, this universe is extraordinarily unlikely. It couldn't have happened this way by chance. I mean, the odds on this, somebody has done a calculation showing, I believe it's that there, the odds are one chance in, and then there's this humongously large number that is greater than all the um, atoms in the universe that we could be here by chance. I mean, it's, it's vanishingly small, hmm. the chance that we are here. And yet, here we are. Yeah. Now, some people have said simply, well... You know, we couldn't be here unless uh, all of this were true. And we could, there's nobody around that could be observing it unless there, they lived in a universe where these rules were actually happening the way they are. Yeah. Well, okay, so that's how we got here. But, Chandra Wickramasinghe and Fred Hoyle, in their book, The Intelligent Universe, concluded, well, that means that before the Big Bang, somebody set the parameters of this universe. Somebody designed it 
an intelligence designed in the physical laws of our cosmos. Wow. They said they're simply, they, they couldn't come up with any other explanation at the time. This was about 20 years ago. Yeah. Before Max Tegmark came along. Yeah. I did. And so they said, and, and, and believe it or not, this was their theory, that there was a prior universe in which intelligent life had eventually appeared and the beings had reached a, what we would call a godlike capability. A civilization arose that was so brilliant, so powerful, that as it watched its own universe coming to an end, they decided to, before their universe was destroyed, they decided to create another universe as their last gasp act, knowing that they could not personally enter into it, but that at least by designing it properly, designing it well, they could communicate indirectly to the intelligent life that would inevitably emerge inside of it. Well, I wish they'd do some better communication. We've got some real murderous nitwits up in Washington. Yeah, well, uh, uh, but they, they thought, gee, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to make ourselves known, not by talking directly to people, but by creating a universe that shows that some intelligence was behind it. Yeah. And leave it up to us to figure out how that happened. Oh, dear. <laughs> Oil and whip Ramasinga to figure out. Yeah. They were. Okay. Well, I got to thinking about this. They, this civilization from this prior universe would have to have been godlike to the point that it had every characteristic of God except eternity because it didn't survive. Yeah. Okay. But it had his power, his omniscience, his beneficence, his wisdom, uh, you know, his intellect. I mean, you know, you're talking about something verging on God. Yeah. And the results are indistinguishable from a creator God. I mean, the result that we see could have been, according to Hoyle and Wick Ramasinghe, could have been created by a, a god or by a this brilliant dying civilization that they have postulated. Now, I think if you were going to choose between the two of these, you, you would have to observe something, I think, pretty basic. God is a spirit. He can exist from one universe to another. I mean, in other words, it doesn't matter to him. But their intelligent civilization that they're postulating was spiritless. It could not survive into the new universe that it supposedly created. So one of the problems is that they're, they're really trying to avoid the existence of spirit. And this is a problem that you see scientists are always uh, fighting. They don't want to admit that there is a spiritual component to reality. They don't want to believe that there is a, a soul or a spirit not only in human beings, but in any sense. And it is that point that separates them from, if you will, the rest of us. They are unable to, I think, experience, a lot of them, spiritual things. They have a, a, an impairment. Now, we, you know a deaf person who is profoundly deaf cannot hear anything. If you are you know, totally blind, if, you have no, if your vision centers simply don't work, you cannot see anything. 
I think it's possible that somebody in their brain could have a defect where they simply cannot detect the presence of a spiritual phenomena. They cannot have a premonition. They cannot have, if you will, the signs of, of psychic abilities present in their brain because they're just not wired for it. What about compassion? Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that they don't have a spirit. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they can't detect it outside of themselves. They're like a closed box. It's just like the deaf person. They think in their heads. They may hear, if you will, uh, uh, their own thoughts somehow. I, don't, I, I mean, I, I haven't been deaf, although I've been around a lot of deaf people, but I, I don't know the degree to which, you know, they're, you know, you could say they hear a voice. But what I would say is that the, that doesn't mean that they aren't capable of producing sound themselves. They do. Uh, and, and so I think it's possible that some of these physicists are wired and, and scientists are wired in such a way that they're so left brain, they're so digital in their way of thinking that they simply don't have a way of relating to those who sense and feel, if you will, uh, spiritual things that are going on in other people outside of themselves. It's the ability to sense the presence of the spirit in others and, if you will, the spirit of God and the spirit of angels or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think some people may be, if you will, uh, a tone deaf to the spiritual world. And if that's the case, and it may go hand in hand with the brilliance of their digital thinking in a scientific sense. I, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, uh, as scientists say, I would love to see a UFO. I look up all the time, but I never see anything. I would love to experience this, that, or the other thing, but I never do. Yeah. And yet other people who aren't even trying to see stuff all the time or hear things or whatever, and for them, it's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I, it, my observation here is that perhaps there is a difference between the people, that it isn't that the phenomena is not real, but that some people are spiritually blind. In fact, the Bible refers to people being spiritually blind uh, and spiritually deaf. You know, uh, they, they cannot see, they cannot hear spiritually. Uh, and so I don't think that it is a far-fetched idea. It's not certainly contrary to what the Bible says, for example. Uh, and therefore, I... I I would just like to put that out there and suggest that maybe somewhere behind this multiverse thinking is a, is somebody who has a handicap, a mental handicap, or if you will, a spiritual handicap, and doesn't realize it because they've never had the experience. It's like if deaf people didn't know they were missing out on stuff, they wouldn't know they were deaf. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's and true. I think a lot of these scientists don't realize. They think it just doesn't exist, you see. Yeah. I, I think they just don't realize that the spiritual world is real. Oh, yes, it's real. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you would bring up Israel. People always do that when we're talking about the Bible. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Uh, but the, the problem is that they want to explain away God. Their thinking is, well, there can't be a God, because they've never had, if you will, spiritual experience. They don't believe people who do. They try to rationalize it away. And notice that key word, rationalize. Uh, they use a digital mindset to somehow undo any kind of evidence that's brought to them. And yet they will assert things that are clearly unscientific and illogical. They'll say, oh, well, uh, it is impossible for anyone to prove the existence of God. Really? 
Well, Whip Rabasega did it. They're scientists. They don't even believe in God. But they came up with what was a very effective proof of the existence of a certainly a godlike being or civilization. That's pretty close. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of tests that you could use, but the bottom line is that the assertion that an agnostic or atheist makes that you cannot prove the existence of God is based upon what experiment? Mm. Yeah. My goodness. They've never experimented. They've never shown that in a scientific way. Uh-huh. Assert it. And we're supposed to buy into it. Another statement they make, they say, well, if something is supernatural, it's not natural. Well, first of all, supernatural is not a biblical term. And I have studied the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, I've studied Gnostic writings, I've studied all kinds of different uh, sacred texts. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. I've never seen anybody use the term supernatural. It's a term that was invented by people who do not believe in spiritual things. And they call it the supernatural meaning the not natural. And then they define it that way. Okay, well, the spiritual side of reality is just as real as the physical materials of our universe. It's another kind of reality. It's part of, if you will, the natural world. The natural world has a spiritual side to it. And it's what holds it together, according to Colossians, uh, Paul writing in the his epistle to the, to the Colossians. And if it holds it all together, then it must be part of, if you almost think of it this way, the spiritual laws it, that govern the, the, the universe. And one of those is the, the, the force inside the atom that holds the atom together. There's such a force. It's one of the four basic forces of nature. And they've been trying to come up with a unified field theory. And this idea is that you can take all four of the forces and somehow you could collapse them together into just one force. (laughs) Well, what if that one force is the force that holds it all together and that one force turned out to be the spiritual energy that Paul is referring to in his epistle to the Colossians, named after the town Colossi in Turkey. Mm-hmm. So, is it possible, in other words, that scientists could, if they had an open mind, which they claim to have, but really don't, is it possible that scientists could detect the presence of spirit and measure it in some way and quantify it and work it into their equations of how the universe is governed. Well, they don't try because they don't want it to be true. There is a philosophical divide between us and them. And as I suggested before, it may be based upon their spiritual blindness. They simply can't see it. They can't hear it. They can't sense it the way others can. Uh, Studies were done by uh, neuro-linguistic scientists. They looked into what people use as a way of of thinking in in terms of there's some people who think visually. Mm -hmm. About 30%, 30% think that way. Some people think auditorily. Everything is in words. Everything's in sound. People think in musical terms. But they they are auditory people. And then there's about 30% who are kinesthetic. Now, the actual percentages vary a little bit from this, but I'm getting to a point here. Uh, And then finally, there's a leftover 10%. That 10% thinks digitally. Everything for them is quantifiable, it's mathematical, it's measured in terms of number. And for this group of people, they behave differently from others. For example, 
uh, auditory people will tend to look from side to side because uh, they're they're sort of tilting their head a little bit to listen. Uh, visuals will tend to look up, and kinesthetics will tend to look down. The digital person stares right at you with a blank stare. <laughs> It's true. I've run into these people, and it's creepy as hell sometimes. So have I, and it is. <laughs> it is. It, you almost feel like they don't have a soul. Yeah, Their exactly. Soul expression. Yeah. They have no expression at all. They stare at you blankly, and you're wondering if you know, sometimes you want to wave a hand in front of their face. Yeah. <laughs> to see if they're really there. Sometimes I find myself shifting from one side to the other to see if their gaze will shift. But, yeah. Know, just to get them to move. Yeah. Um, they're totally unanimated. And I wonder sometimes if uh, some of the scientists who are unable to comprehend spiritual things, I wonder how digital they are. And if this doesn't, in fact, uh, represent some kind of, of, I hate to put it this way, but mental impairment some kind of shortfall in their ability to think. A short circuit. Yeah, that something might not be plugged in properly in their brain. And mm -hmm. so they just simply can't, uh, they can't relate. Well, those kind of people, very often taking it a step further, uh, lack empathy for other people. Um, in other words, they kind of lack consciousness. Uh, conscience, and they are um, proverbial psychopaths. Well, I don't want to go that far, because I, I, I used some names here. <laughs> and I don't know these people personally. So, uh, but, yeah, sometimes the psychopath is a, it can be a person who simply has no empathy at all for other people, uh, sees the world very selfishly, and is unable to relate to other people. Kind of like the European Union right now. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, well, I, I could think of certain countries that seem to have leaders like that. Yeah, yeah we both can. <laughs> so, uh, there. Uh, one of the examples of this was uh, uh, now deceased Saddam Hussein. Yeah who would murder people with impunity. And his two sons were as bad as he was. Oh, yeah. I mean, they would take college girls on the weekend and they would just, uh, you know, work them over sexually and then kill them and dump their bodies. And it was They were just horrible people, horrible. And they seemed to have no compunction at all about how they were treating these people. They, 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 there didn't seem to be any conscience involved at all. Uh, if there was a boyfriend or a husband who tried to resist taking the woman, they would take him and throw him to the animals. They had some pet, was it uh, tigers or something, yeah. with the two sons of Saddam Hussein had, and they would feed the, the boyfriend or the husband to the to the animals and so forth. It was just, these guys were just viciously monstrous. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Uh, you wonder, how do people who think that way come into being, you know? They're not, they're not just bullies or something. They, they go beyond bullying to having no sense of, of compassion for other human beings whatsoever. They're just right. void. You wonder if they've ever cried, you know, ever shed a tear for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm not saying that about the scientists. Uh, I don't believe that that's the situation. What I think is that they quantify everything to the point that their mind doesn't doesn't go to a place where the spirit can operate. Their mind is constantly occupied with numbers in a way where they, they simply can't relate to things that have a different uh, part of the brain that they have to pass through and, and, and to access. Right. Uh, I think that I think there there is something going on there. I'm, I'm tr trying to explain where this comes from. But the second thing I want to mention is this: Tegmark himself actually said 
he, as his opening premise, that he, he looked at this business that Hoyle and Wick Robisega and, and others had come up with uh, as they looked into this so-called anthropic principle that the universe is designed for, for human life, or life as we understand it. Um, and he said, well, that has to be a chance occurrence. And yet, the odds against it in our universe are just monumental. So that means there must be lots of other universes. And because it is so difficult to accomplish, to get life as we understand it in any universe, uh, he said, well, there must be an infinite number of other universes. And for that, he postulated the multiverse. Yeah. And this, and, and, and why was this necessary, again, to go back to the point that, well, it has to be by chance, because the alternative is an intelligently designed universe. Mm -hmm. An intelligent design, which, as Hoyle and Wick Rabasinga have shown, doesn't necessarily have to involve a creator god or a spiritual realm, as we understand it. Uh, it no matter what kind of intelligence you're talking about, is unacceptable to some of these people. Now, you would think that that would be the opposite. You would think that an intelligently designed universe would appeal to a digital mind. But instead, they prefer one based upon chaos and random chance. Because if they do that, then they don't have to confront the other things that a god demands of humanity, which makes, if you will, the extreme digital agnostic type uncomfortable. Because what that God is demanding of you is, as you put it, empathy. Yeah. He's demanding love. He's demanding compassion, sympathy, understanding. Uh, things that may be difficult for, if you will, the cold-blooded rationalist to get their mind around. Yeah. <laughs> part around. Yep. So if you get to the point where somebody can't handle God, this is where Jack Nicholson needs to step up to the plate here and do a commercial for God. <laughs> you can't handle the truth, you know. Yeah. Well, the fact is that I, I think they simply can't handle spiritual truth. They can't handle the idea that there could be a God. It's an unacceptable possibility to them. Someone who's more powerful than they are. Yeah. They wouldn't be the pinnacle of creation anymore. Yeah. They wouldn't, you know, they see themselves as the elite of mankind. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're the smartest guys out there, you know, they're the, the cosmologists and the neurosurgeons and the... Uh, and the EU. Medic dentists. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. In Washington, D.C. Uh, well, now I mentioned the cosmetic dentists because they're some of the highest paid people on the planet. <laughs> oh, boy. But... Uh, the, the the fact is that the, you know they see themselves as the pinnacle of civilization, and they want to believe that that we are, uh, you know, the best there is. And the minute you have to acknowledge that there's somebody vastly smarter than you are, and you've prided yourself your whole life on your intellect, and that's how you relate to the world. Well, I'm, I'm a Ph.D., I've got this, I'm, I'm a professor of that, I've accomplished this, and so forth. And you see yourself that way, and then somebody comes along and says, you're an idiot compared to the God who created the universe. All of a sudden, it's a very humbling experience. And for some people, it's an unacceptable confrontation with reality. Mm -hmm. They just can't handle that. So I don't know... You know, I, I, I've never met Max. I don't know. You know, he may be a very empathetic uh, guy, but he's not a religious guy. <laughs> I know that. His basic premise is there cannot be a God. Therefore, there must be a chance explanation for how our very unique and unusual universe got here. 
and therefore there must be an infinite number or close to it uh, of universes like ours out there so that this one is not a chance occurrence. Well, but that led to the next set of problems. He then postulated what he called the infinite multiverse. And he argued that in every uh, potential universe that you could have, there are certain things that are going to be different from every other potential universe. There's an infinite number of possibilities. So if all universes are possible, and, and that would follow if you've got one like ours, according to him. Remember, it, he's arguing from the premise that there is no God. It cannot be one. So if you've got an infinite number of universes, as far as the mind can see, then the universe that is the multiverse must be infinitely old to have generated an infinite number of universes. Hmm. It must last for an infinite period into the future. And it has an infinite number of possibilities. So that every kind of universe, including ours, must occur at least once. Okay. But then he, he was struck by the next problem, the next logical problem. So far, so good. If there were no God, and if you had to explain away this universe, you'd, you'd come to this stage, and you'd, you'd be okay logically. But then he made, a, he made a leap that is not logical. He then said, but the fact that we're in this one is extremely unlikely. Meaning that this universe itself, the, you know, that, that, that we're here, is an extremely unlikely event. Our, you know, why should we be in just this particular very unlikely universe? Because, he says... There must be an almost infinite number of possible ways you could have a universe that had life in it, as unlikely as we are. Now, that is not a provable or logical idea, necessarily. And from there, he leapt to the next conclusion, which was that there are not only are there an infinite number of universes with life in them, but that there are an infinite number of universes just like this one, in which you and I are doing exactly what we're doing right now, right down to the smallest detail. You understand? Yes. An exact copy. Yeah. He's saying there are an infinite number of universes just like that out there. Huh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now we're way past logic into illogic and false logic. I studied formal logic in college. It's one of the things I studied. i got to tell you right now that I can't understand how he can say this with a straight face. Because there is no such number as infinity plus one, much less infinity times infinity, which yeah. is what he's proposing. Wow. He's saying that for every possible universe, there are an infinite number of exact copies of it. Well, infinity is a is an ultimate number. It, it's a barrier number, just like zero is. Okay, uh, you you have to say that it is the limit of of how many universes you can have. So, if we got an infinite number of universes and we have an infinite number of possible universes, that each possibility can occur only once. Hmm. Or one of those two statements was false. Now, I think it's an infinite number of possible universes. If you have an infinite number of universes, okay, there may not be an infinite number of possible universes. If you can have a universe occur more than once, and you can, that it follows that the number of possible universes is not infinite. So, and that makes scientific sense as well, because we know that a lot of things that you can try to do 
in creating a universe won't work. It'll just fizzle. It'll collapse and it won't expand. It, it won't become a stars. It won't produce anything. It'll just poof out. <laughs> Uh, so we know there are some possibilities that simply don't work. So I think it's safe to say that there are a limited number of possible universes. There may be more than one copy of some, but there can't be an infinite number of any one because we know that the kind of universe we live in is very unlikely, but there are other possible universes. So I know this is getting terribly logical, and now only the digitals are still awake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, but if you bear with me for a second here, uh, his argument that there are an infinite number of universes and uh, an infinite number just like ours, but that we represent infinity divided by infinity, well, hold on a second here. <laughs> it, the, you can't make this equation work on a blackboard or in a calculator. It won't work. It's not sound math, to say nothing of sound logic. Uh, so it, it just doesn't work. There are not an infinite number of universes identical to ours. There might be Theoretically, if there were no God and this were the only explanation, there might be theoretically some other universes out there. But, you know, and they might have some life in them. Uh, but they wouldn't be identical to us because it's very unlikely that there would be an infinite number of such universes because you, that would mean that all universes were identical in terms of producing life. And we've already shown, as Chandrawick, Robinson, and Fred Hoyle proved, that this is a very rare and unlikely universe. So this, there, even if you had a truly large number of other universes, very few would actually have life in them uh, similar to ours. And, and thank God I'm not, you know, putting people to sleep in another universe right now by talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, it's it, that, 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 that that is something that, that is likely to occur. But they say, well, the microwave background shows evidence that we've bumped into other universes. And if I had a buzzer, I'd sound it right now because that's not true. Wow! The microwave background is not a backdrop. It is not the backdrop behind the galaxies. It is the local medium of microwaves in our vicinity. That's what, the word background is very ill chosen, I'm afraid. It should be the microwave soup. <laughs> yeah. In which we are stewing. Okay. This is the, the, the microwave ether, if you will. It is the stuff that is around us. We could set up our radio detectors. Actually, you're, you, you have a TV that you can turn on and see uh, static? If you do, that's the microwave background. And it's right there in your living room. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. It's not out there beyond the galaxies. It's right here. Okay. That's what they're talking about. Hmm. Now, they put satellites above the atmosphere to detect this uh if you will, this radiation uh, microwave is just really, 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 really cold heat radiation. Okay? Uh, and it, it's left over from uh, something that was intensely hot at one time and has now cooled. And they, they say it's uh, 2.7 degrees or so uh, Kelvin which means it's almost absolute zero and it's just a little above it. And this, uh, this, this is a static temperature that they're measuring that is uh, slowly declining and in you know, billions of years will be cooler still and so forth. But as they look in different directions, it looks slightly warmer, slightly colder in different directions. 
and, and let me emphasize the word slightly. I mean really, really slightly. Now, if you see the pictures, the the YMAP picture, W-Y-M-A-P, uh, or some of these other images of the sky that they say, well, this is the microwave background of the universe. Yeah. Uh, it, again, it is the microwave soup in which we live as detected at the Earth. <laughs> oh, boy. And, yeah, in some directions it looks a little uh, warmer or a little cooler than it does in other directions, but it's pockmarked like that. Mm. And until we know why it's pockmarked, and these are terribly slight variations that could be due to fluctuations that are affecting the equipment that we're using to detect it. Uh, it could be due to another source of microwave out there. It could be due to some intervening medium of some kind that has uh, cooled or heated it in, in some places in the universe so that we're detecting it after it's been warmed up or, or whatever. Uh, but it's such a slight difference, a slight variation, that for all intents and purposes, it's pretty smooth in every direction. So they, there is a lot of dispute about this, but the one thing it does not show us is bumping into other universes. Oh. Because think about it for a minute. To bump into our universe, you have to share at least one of our four dimensions or three dimensions. And if you're going to bump into us and you share one of our dimensions, you're here now. Yeah. And we are sharing the same space with something else. And we should be able to detect that pretty easily. <laughs> I wish we'd get rid of that something else. <laughs> yeah, that something else is in your living room. Oh, boy. And if there's an infinite number of them, mm. well, then they're sharing all of our dimensions at this point. And some of them must be sharing all three. And they must be blasting through your living room right now. And you're not there because oh. you've just been destroyed. Oh, dear. See, if there really were an infinite number of other universes, and they were bumping into us, mm -hmm. we'd be creamed by that. I mean, it would just clobber us. The heat and the blast waves and stuff. You have big bangs going off in your bathroom, and not the kind you're thinking about. I mean, there would be uh, just enormous amounts of energy being released all around you all the time. And these other universes wouldn't be out there. They'd be in here. Wow. And you couldn't get this smooth microwave background in all directions with very little variation if there had ever been another universe anywhere near us. It wouldn't look like that. So these slight variations that they see would have to be due to something else or something very distant from us because we've expanded a very long way and if there's something outside of our universe that has in some way affected the microwave, yeah. then that would have to be something so far off that we haven't been able to expand into it. Hmm. It's still out there. And whatever affected us must have been some slight little bit of radiation coming from it. And that's very unlikely as well, because our universe is apparently a runaway expander. We're accelerating. And you would have to argue there must be other universes out there that are accelerating. If there's an infinite number of them, again, you run into the problem that we're all accelerating into each other. And if this has been going on for eternity, for an infinite amount of time, then once again, you know, you, you just can't have the smooth, spherical, microwave uh, image that they want to create of our universe just can't be. So that gets us back to the universe we actually live in, which doesn't seem to have anything else around it. We have not detected, and this, by the way, is what, uh, this is in Scientific American, among other sources, uh, we just have not detected the existence of any other universes. We haven't. Nor does it seem likely that we can this is all a mind game, a word game. 
multiverse exists in the minds of people. It doesn't exist out there in a scientific sense. And it exists in their minds because they're worried about God. Okay, I get it. I understand your problem, but it's not a scientific problem. It's an emotional problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's a psychological problem. It's not a scientific one. Yeah. Okay, you can't come to terms with the, the evidence that's in front of you. This universe shows no sign that it bumped into anything, nor could it. Let me explain why. We're in a bubble inside our universe. That The outside of that bubble is the limits of what we can see with our telescopes, radio telescopes, gamma ray detectors, etc. And we can only see a limited distance. We think it's about uh, 13, 14 billion light years out. But uh, they think this universe is over 40 billion light years in diameter and expanding at an accelerating rate. In other words, we can't see the limit of it. We can't see the wall, the outer limit, despite what that TV show tried to imply. We cannot see beyond our little bubble of capability. And it's not just our current technology. It's that the thing is expanding so fast that things at the limit are moving faster away from us than the speed of light relative to where we are, and so they're undetectable by any equipment. There's no technology that can be invented to see it, so far as we can imagine. And therefore, we're not able to see the microwaves beyond that point either. We cannot see the limits of the universe, so you can't see whether something has bumped into us or not. Good point. <laughs> so, if there are anastrophes or distortions or little fluctuations in the microwave, they must be due to something inside the universe. And fine, figure out what that is. But don't try to hijack one field of science in order to prop up a philosophical problem you have in another field of science. You know, that's that's not kosher. That's not right. This stuff that these guys are proposing just simply doesn't have any scientific basis. It's all uh, fictionalization. I was looking at the concept of daughter universes. This is a proposal that's been put forward by a, a mathematician who came up with the inflation theory. And they're proposing that there's a false vacuum out there, that there are quantum fluctuations out there, that the, sometimes that things drop out of our universe into the quantum uh, field outside of the universe, and they, they run into a false vacuum or they or they go into a state of a false vacuum and then suddenly they explode into another big bang and create another universe right next door to us. Well, actually, it's not right next door to us. It's inside of us. Okay. And where are we getting this from? Well, we're getting it from a black hole. What they're arguing is that something falls into a black hole, goes through a wormhole, comes out the other side, and generates a whole new universe in a big bang a daughter universe. Hmm. Well, there's a little bit of a problem. That means that the matter and energy summed together, the, if you will, the total uh, quantity of stuff of which that other universe is made, is the amount of stuff that falls into the black hole, through the wormhole, and out the other side. Well, is the whole universe falling through that black hole? that whatever is coming out the other side cannot be as massive, as energetic, if you will, in total sum, because matter and energy can switch into each other, but the total sum remains constant. It, it, that total sum cannot be any greater than what falls through the black hole through the wormhole. Okay? Well, guess what? We don't know if there are wormholes. We don't know if there's a quantum field outside of the universe, and we don't know if there's a false vacuum. But wait, we do know something. We know that a black hole has gravity. We know the gravity is caused by the matter that fell into the black hole. 
So unless we can detect that the gravity of a black hole is weakening precipitously, in which case it sort of pop out. <laughs> yeah. But unless we can show that a black hole is actually uh, getting lighter and that the matter is falling out of our universe, and I haven't heard anybody suggest that yet, that the gra whatever is producing the gravity that creates the black hole seems to be constant. In fact, all the black holes I know of, they say, are growing, not shrinking. Mm. As long as they're growing, then the theory that something falling through a wormhole and creating another universe on the other side is, to say the least, not demonstrated. Yeah. Okay. And so far, I mean, that doesn't falsify the possibility. But it certainly shows that it doesn't seem to be happening. So you've got to find one where it is happening before you can argue that it does happen and before you can then conclude that there are other potential universes somewhere out there being created that way. So uh, they don't have a mechanism to explain how you get a Big Bang. It's all hypothetical. They don't have a mechanism to explain how you get daughter universes falling out of black holes. They don't have any evidence to show that black holes are in fact shrinking like that. Um, they don't have these false vacuum quantum field uh, observations because you can't, because you can't see outside of this universe. They don't know what the microwave background looks like at the back of it that is on the outer edge of the universe. They don't know what the outer edge of the universe looks like. And every galaxy that we can see, no matter how far out we look, looks pretty much like the galaxies that are nearby. In other words, the universe is unimaginably large, which is why I've argued it's more than 13.8 billion years old, that the way in which they're doing that calculation, I suspect there's a flaw in it somewhere. I think they're measuring the local universe. They're measuring the age of our vicinity. What part of it, you know, the galaxies around us may be about that old. That's about how old our galaxy is. But that doesn't necessarily mean, because we're one of the oldest galaxies in our supercluster. And the kinds of measurements they do are measuring the isotopic content of stars, and all kinds of stuff like that. Well, they're only measuring stuff nearby. They can't see and resolve a star that's outside of our supercluster. So you're really limited to really saying, well, our supercluster is about 13.8 billion years, or 13.77, I think they got it refined down to. But I don't think you can really say anything about the universe beyond that. I think that's very dubious. Uh, you know, I'm very conservative in my science, believe it or not. Um, you know, I've been an amateur astronomer, uh, studied uh, this sort of thing for over half a century. And one thing I notice is that uh, when people come up with these theories about the universe and its origins, the Big Bang and how old it is and how big it is and so forth, every 10 years or so, we get a whole new revision. And they say, uh, never mind what we were saying before wasn't true. <laughs> so now the, our current version is it's 13.77 billion years old, and it's expanding at an accelerating rate. That's the current paradigm. Okay, all of that was heresy 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when they were saying the whole universe was less than 10 billion years old. I remember when there were people saying it was 36 billion years. There were scientists putting forward 36 billion. They've been all over the map with this stuff. Yeah. Okay. The trouble is we see through a glass as if darkly. We see very little of the universe. And we, when we look at it, the farther out you look, the farther back in time you're looking. It's very hard to create a kind of a real-time visualization of even what our local part of the universe looks like. Mm -hmm. I don't really think we have attained enough understanding yet to explain how old the universe is or how it got here beyond saying that it does appear as though it is expanding 
it does appear as though there was a big bang, a burst of light at the beginning. But after all, God is light, God is spirit, a universe filled with uh, light that has turned some of it into matter, and uh, other of it is uh, spirit and so forth. That is not inconsistent with what the Bible tells us. The Bible never gives an age for the universe. It, uh, it picks up with, uh, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then after that it starts talking about the genealogy of this guy Adam. <laughs> but the genealogy of the family uh, it says nothing about the age of the heavens and the earth. And as much as people have tried to twist the scriptures and say, oh, it doesn't really mean God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, it really means that he created a time-space continuum. <laughs> oh, and the heavens and the earth were created on the fourth day or the third day or whatever. Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. You know, it says they were created in the beginning, whatever that might be, and it doesn't date that. Uh, so, you know, I think that the, there there is a there is grounds for consistency between science and scripture, and I might add, a lot of the scriptures of the world are pretty well consistent. In, in, uh, in how they view the, the, the larger picture of things. Uh, but this idea that there's an infinite number of universes just like ours and so forth, it, it's mathematical nonsense. It's a word game. It's illogical. Uh, you know, I mean, you limited me to an hour to explain the universe. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it, really, it really does not hold up. It's there simply to prop up atheism and agnosticism in those scientists who cannot deal with the spiritual possibilities that are all around them that apparently they are tone deaf to. Uh, those of us who've had spiritual experiences know that the spiritual realm is real. We don't have a problem with it. Uh, but if you haven't had those experiences, if you haven't been able to cross that barrier, uh, I can understand how difficult it must be for them. But uh, that doesn't mean that they can impose upon the rest of us an infinite, you know, the weight of an infinite number of universes because of their unbelief. Yeah. Well said, Elof. Well said. Tell people how they can get a hold of your materials. Uh, well, you don't have to go to another universe. You simply have to go to... <laughs> Uh, go to before 2012 and beyond. dot com, and uh, they have lots of downloads over there and uh, things that uh, you can order on CD. Uh, there's MP3 CD collections. Uh, we put 11 or 12 hours on a CD on oh gosh, uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 topics. And uh, then there are also the CD-ROM reports, of the Eyes Only series, only for subscribers, however. Uh, but those are uh, extremely uh, uh, important. I mean, that's, uh, that's the most important thing I do, I think, because I document footnote there. Uh, you kind of must realize there are lots of uh, sources that I have to use. Yeah. And so I put the references in there. So it's at before... 2012 and A and D beyond all one word dot com before 2012 and beyond dot com. Uh, now, my email address, the Yahoo email address, I believe Yahoo's been hacked. I just heard about this a couple of days ago. Yeah. And uh, don't bother emailing me. <laughs> that's not going to work. I have a feeling that that's. Uh, dead in the water right now, so I don't, I'm not sending anybody to my website at the moment because that's full of my Yahoo email address, and they'll, they'll send emails that I will never see. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll, we're going to have to uh, find a way to fix all of that. I, I, there must be some way to solve this problem of these big corporations allowing their big fancy computers with all their software to be hacked into yeah. uh, anonymously. Hmm. What do you, before we go, Olaf, what is your take on us um, giving medals to these kids sitting at the joystick 
somewhere here and uh, using the drones to just kill people. They're giving medals to them? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. And those medals, they say, are of higher value than the ones earned by the men with boots on the ground. Well, you know, when you can't be shot back at, yeah, I would say lower value. Yeah, I would too. Now, I'm not sure what you get the, get the medal for. You could be replaced by a computer. With Probably AI. you get a medal for killing so many people. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, that, that, that's sort of like running up a score at a video game. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's fine if they want to give them a, a, not a medal, but maybe, a, you know, a score for, you know, killing, I don't know. Doesn't I don't think any of it's fine. I think it's plain frickin' murder. Well, it it does seem unfair when the guys who are being shot don't even realize there's a drone overhead firing at them. Yeah. And, and I, I guess you could say that. Uh, but you know, you don't. If you when you go to war, the other guy comes up with weapons that are going to kill you. You it's kind of the chance you take when you take up arms against another country. But but this is not a declared war. Uh, it's declared by the other side. No. It is. No. It is. No. It is. No. <laughs> they, are, they, These guys who are shooting at us and blowing up people and so forth, they have declared war against the United States and against Israel, the greater Satan and the lesser Satan, as they call us. They have. Okay? We can't just sort of be a punching bag and sit back and, you know, and not respond to this. We have to find some way to deal with that. Olaf, the Somalis have not declared war on us. The the Yemenis have not declared war on us. Well, I think they, you know they, they're going after Al Qaeda leaders. Who oh, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda! What a bunch of garbage! Well, you know, I mean, these people live in an alternate universe. They they don't see the world the way we do. And they think that it's okay to kill women and children in marketplaces, even their own people. So do we. We kill women and children. Uh, but we don't do it just deliberately to kill women and children. We're, we're trying to find the enemy and kill the enemy. They just do it to blow up the marketplace. You know, uh, you know I, think that there's, I think there's a different philosophy there. We don't gang rape news women on, on the air live in in downtown Cairo. I mean, we don't do that. That's not. I'm not saying that the United States isn't capable of it. <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder. But um, you know, there is a difference. There, there is a distinction between the two cultures in terms of what um, what they are willing to accept and the horrible things they're willing to do to each other and to us and so forth. And uh, Unfortunately, when you have an enemy like that, as we did in World War II as well, uh, where they were willing to do some pretty horrible things, you you are forced to down to, toward their level to some extent. There is a you know there is something that you have to do to 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 respond to it. I think that you know I mean it would be hours of discussion to get into 9/11 and a lot of these other issues that are related to all of this. I said in 9-11, if you'll recall, that the proper response was to rebuild the World Trade Center exactly the way it was before and not to go to Afghanistan. I was not in favor of bombing Afghanistan or going over to Afghanistan. Uh, and I was not in favor of going into Iraq. I said we should go and put you know, uh, a couple of uh, bombs down and force Saddam Hussein into his underground bunker and then drop cement on the exit. <laughs> that was my proposal. Okay, uh, that's somewhere I think on one of your recordings in your library somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, my proposals are not to go to war. My proposals are to to find alternative solutions to these things. Um, but I I understand that once you're in the war, you've got another problem, and that is, what are your alternatives at that point? Uh, every new president of the United States is faced with fait accompli, uh, situations that are handed to them that they have to deal with as they find them. They're created. Well, yeah, but I mean, somebody 
created a war or whatever, you're in the middle of it. When, when you take your own office, and what are you going to do about it? This is what Obama found when he came into office. He had two wars going on, one in Afghanistan and one in Iraq, and a general war against terrorism. And the question was, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, the question is, who is the terrorist? And I think that it's pretty obvious that the United States has become the global terrorist of the world. Well, I don't, uh, I mean, I, I can't agree with you. Uh, I know you don't. I think that I think that Islam has become a, a problem, but we created that. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, the Nazis had funded the Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood created Al Qaeda. No, we created Al Qaeda. I, yeah. Okay. The, 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 yeah. There's stages to this. I, I left one out. After the war <laughs> over, uh, and the Nazis were supposedly defeated, and I use the word supposedly, uh, the CIA took over. Yeah. The OSS, and then the CIA, as it became took over the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, operation. We, we uh, funded them in the Middle East, and they became our representatives in the Middle East. They, and we then, created Al-Qaeda. Okay, now, uh, after we, after uh, the Soviets were defeated in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda basically thought that they were you know, that we were going to behave differently than we did. Uh, I'm not er entirely clear on what it was that Laden thought we were going to do, but whatever it was, we didn't do it. Uh, and so he got pissed off, and he started attacking us. Okay? Well, uh, so we sort of created the problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we knew who this guy was. We recruited him. We had the MI6 and the British intelligence. He's our creation. Uh, he was a party boy up in London uh, gambling in the casinos. When we picked him up and started telling him that he needed to go back and uh, start you know, helping his people and so forth. Um, so he did what we asked him to do, and then he felt betrayed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, gee, <laughs> You know what? That's how taxpayers feel. Uh, yeah. That's how a lot of people feel, uh, because the politicians have betrayed us. We were supposed to, Obamacare was supposed to lower the cost of health care. Oh, hell. They increased it. <laughs> yes. We're betrayed all the time by politicians. And, and, and you know what gets me, Olaf? Just because they pass a, quote, end of quote, law, the American people think they have to go by it. They have to abide by it. Well, you, and that's there just, are consequences for breaking the law. That is just a bunch of doopucky. Oh, well, uh, can, do you suppose we can edit this after the universe part? <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> I mean, because, I mean, I, I really, I don't think that... Um, I, I don't think that anybody uh, should break the law, because uh, if you do, you're going to... If it's a legitimate law. It's not up to you to make that decision. We have a process called the Supreme Court and, and so forth designed to do that. <laughs> However, ineptly it might be structured. Yeah. We are a, a, a nation of laws, not of men. Uh, there's certainly no men left. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, we are, we are supposed to uh, abide by our Constitution and the rules under which it operates. Yeah, there the are. government is supposed to abide by the Constitution, which they do not. I agree with you. The government is violating the Constitution right and left. We have a renegade in the White House mm -hmm. by a renegade in the Senate named Harry Reid. Okay, but thank God we still have elections, and at some point, um, you know, we still have some laws that... That hopefully they will obey, uh, and we will get a chance in 2016 to replace Harry Reid uh, and replace the Democrats and control the Senate uh, and replace the president with uh, somebody who has uh, respect for the Constitution. We're hoping that will happen. Yeah, we're hoping. But 
uh, I mean, this we could do a whole file on why it may not happen. Yeah. Not because of them, because we know what the other side is capable of. We see them steal elections. We see them cheat. We see them do a lot of things. Yes. Okay. It's our side that's the problem. Hmm. People who should be on our side, that is the people's side, uh, are not. Yeah. Oh, well, they're paid by Democrats. Uh, they're paid by liberals. Well, most of these talk show hosts, uh, the companies that uh, they work for, are uh, run by Democrats. And most of the time when these guys are on the air, they're talking left-wing politics. Yeah. And here's what this left-wing blogger said. Here's what this host on MSNBC that nobody watches said. And you wouldn't know, the world would not know anything about these idiots and what they say on the left if the so-called conservative, pseudo-conservative talk show host didn't keep repeating it. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you you take some obscure blogger on the left, some uh, neo-communist blogger who has 50 or 60 people going to their website, and apparently half of them are conservative talk show hosts. Oh, boy. I'm sorry, but, you know, that's not helping. Right. There's an old saying in advertising, it doesn't matter what you say about the product as long as you spell the name right. (laughs) Okay? In other words, it doesn't matter what they say about these liberal bloggers and their accusations about conservatives and Christians and Republicans of the United States and our Constitution. It just matters that you keep repeating it. And the trouble is that if you repeat it enough, as anybody in advertising will tell you, the number of impressions is the power of advertising. The more impressions you have, the more powerful the ad will be. So that's why they keep repeating the phone number, repeating the name of the product of the ad. Okay? If the rest of the ad you forget, but you remember that part about the, you know, the, the product slogan that they repeat or whatever. Well, what are we repeating? We're repeating, and I'm not going to do it, but you know what the, the, the liberals keep saying about conservatives. Oh, yeah. Well, where are we hearing this from? <laughs> We're hearing it from a bunch of cigar-chopping, middle-aged white guys who act like bullies on the air and who are supposed to represent us, but almost all of whom were hired by Democrats because they figured these are caricatures of the conservatives and of the Republicans. Oh, boy. That's why they hired them. They hired them because they are bullies. Mm. They are uh, middle-aged white guys chopping on cigars. That's what they think Republicans are like. That's what they think conservatives are like. That's what they caricature us to be like. And they find the biggest bullies out there, put them on the radio. Mm-hmm. And then they say, see, that's that's the Republican Party. That's conservatives. Those are the Tea Party people. You don't really want to vote for them, do you? Oh, gee. Okay. And then if you do happen to listen to them, 90% of what you're hearing is them playing clips of Obama or Nancy Pelosi, or Harry Reid, or some blogger you've never heard of on the left. And you have to strain uh, to hear one word spoken by some conservative. You know, the conservative politicians and the conservative thinkers out there, you don't get to hear. Yeah. You know, there are a handful of guys, oh, they'll have John Bader on. Or they'll have... Um, uh, what's uh, the, the senator, uh, minority senator McCullough? Is it? Uh, they'll they'll have uh, people on who are uh, oh gosh, what's the proper word for them? Uh, uninspiring. <laughs> yeah, uninspiring. Yeah. Uh, and I, I heard Marco Rubio, and he was uninspiring. And they're saying, boy, he's terrific. And I'm thinking. Huh? Yeah. I'm sorry, he wasn't. He was uninspiring. 
I was not moved by that. I think American politics in general is uninspiring. <laughs> Boy. You know, we have a nation that is uh, uh, is headed toward disaster if we keep depending on talk show hosts to pick our candidates, because they never do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They kept telling us all along, well, we can support Mitt Romney. Well, maybe you can. Yeah. I can. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I was never, and so did millions of other voters. As you can see, Romney fell way short even of John McCain in 2008. Mm-hmm. And he shouldn't have. Okay, if we had had almost anybody but maybe Rex Santorum, who, you know, no coalist industry lobbyist is ever going to get elected president. That's mm-hmm. not going to happen. You know, I mean, it's a joke that anybody paid any attention at all to Santorum. He may be a nice guy, but you're not going to see a coal industry lobbyist run the gauntlet of Democrat ads and win. Yeah. Happen. I mean, I could, I could, I could write those ads. <laughs> they're oh, so easy gee. to write. Okay. I mean, there's just simply no way that that that, that somebody like that's going to get elected. But there are people out there that could have been elected. I mean, we certainly Gingrich would have beaten Obama in this race. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, Michelle Bachman could have because she's got no record. Yeah. You know, she's got nothing to run on. You know, a few years in Congress doing nothing. That's not a, that's not going to work. But, uh, the, you know, Gary Johnson from Arizona, he probably could have, uh, if they'd allowed him in the debates, if they'd given him a chance, he might have been able to do it. Uh, you he know, was from New Mexico. Uh, uh, was it New Mexico? Yeah. yeah. Whatever. But, I mean, you know, if you got somebody who's got executive experience, who's been a governor, uh, who's led something, who's accomplished something, uh, who's reasonably intelligent and competent, uh, and who who does not support Obamacare in any form. Yeah. Did. Uh, you know, Do you know that the cheapest Obamacare will cost an average family of, I think, four? $20,000. Yes, $20,000 a year. And, and a if, lot of people don't even make that a uh, year. And if you refuse to buy the insurance, it's going to cost you 16000 Well, they can just up and up and up and up, you know. You can't get blood out of turnips. Well, uh, I, I, what I think is going to happen here is that they're going to have to fix it. They're going to have to revise it. Well, th- I know our state, Oklahoma, they're threatening... Uh, that if they try to implement it, uh, they're going to get, uh, the people that try to implement it will get five years in jail. Well, I think the states have to comply with it. They have to uh, do something or, or it won't be implemented in their state. Yeah, they, they have to make an exchange. Right. And I think Oklahoma is not going to do that. Yeah, I think an awful lot of the states are not going to set up these health, health exchanges. Yeah. Exchanges. Um, your relationship with your doctor in your town is not of the federal government's jurisdiction. Yeah. They have no business. See, the reason they, they regulate the drugs your doctor prescribes is that they cross state lines. In fact, most of them cross national lines or come out of Europe. Uh, so the government does have the ability to regulate interstate commerce, and that's the basis for the FDA. Okay. But your doctor in your local community who is treating you, they, the government has no jurisdiction. There's no constitutional authority for them to step between you and your doctor. And the only way they can do that is if the government gives you money and says, well, we have a right to d- dictate how it's spent. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, if you don't accept the government's money, then the string that's attached to it, it, you know, it doesn't go with it either. Yeah. It's the it's accepting the government's help <laughs> in terms of Medicare or Obamacare or whatever. Accepting money from the government is what causes the problem. Yeah. And that's why 
you know, if you accept money for your educational system, if you accept it for your health care system or for your roads and your bridges or anything else, you become addicted to it. Yeah. And you, and the government then can tell you what to do with your roads and bridges and your and your uh, body parts and so forth. Oh, gee. Olaf, 